Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, let's begin our session this morning with uh, Ummul Kitab Al-Fatihah. Okay, so um, you all are third year and this is your your first uh, your first week, isn't it? Uh, okay, few 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 reminders. Eh? Um, uh, all the online teachers yes. using Zoom, they are recorded. So this recording, uh, let me wait. Let me pause the recording first. Okay, the topic this morning that I'm going to start today is about communication in pediatrics. This is the topic that should be discussed ideally. The initial plan was for uh, afternoon, but I, I, I'm i doing this first. Okay, kita, we'll discuss about the afternoon session after this. Okay, this topic is regarding communication in pediatrics. This is a new topic that we just started, um, uh, I think, last block. Uh, before this, we don't have this topic. Why we put this topic in? Because a few things. The first thing is that we notice that among the problem with uh, medical professionals, uh, with doctors, with junior doctors, is communication. If you see at medical legal cases, the commonest problem that results in medical legal issues is actually communication problem. So uh, when you don't communicate well to your patient, the uh, problem too uh, can happen. Even though sometimes it's actually just a matter of you convincing the, 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 the patient, talking properly with your patient. The moment when there is communication breakdown, that is the moment where medical legal issues can, can arise. So we see that the most problem is because of communication. So we need to rectify this problem. And I've worked in, 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 in many hospitals in Malaysia, in hospitals that are mainly Malay Muslim and hospitals that are, uh, consist of professionals from other race as well. And I see that especially among Malays, sometimes our communication is a bit problematic. So sometimes we may appear very Islamic in our appearance. Kan? Tengok muka tu ustaz dah. Ha. Tengok gaya tu ustaz, tengok gaya tu macam ustazah kan? Ha, tapi mulutnya macam sampah. Uh, I'm sorry to say lah. Tapi there is so many instances of like this. Kan? Gaya macam ustaz ustazah cakap pun UIA, Islamic, Al-Jami'ah, Al-Islamiyah, Al-Alamiyah, Maliji. Ha. Sekali butir mulut uh, tak macam apa. Macam uh, Arya Sharon dia bunyi soal cakap kan. So sometimes we don't actually practice our religion. Sebab Muslim, they should be Khairun nas anfa'uhum lin nas kan sebaik baik nabi kata sebaik baik uh, the best of mankind are those that are beneficial to other people dalam dalam satu hadis lain eh, uh, the, the prophet mention la yu'minu ahadukum hatta yuhibba li akhi ma yuhibbu li nafsi kan uh, you are not a believer until you like uh, you 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 are not a believer until you prefer something for your brother what you would prefer for yourself. Maknanya, if you would like people to talk to you with respect, so you would like your brother to receive communication with respect as well. Huh? Uh, so, uh, uh, apa lagi? There are so many hadith about this. There are so many hadith. Uh, a good Muslim is someone that uh, his tongue is not harmful to others for example there are so many hadith nabi talk about how uh, we should be kind to others we should talk properly to other people so there are so many examples and the prophet is actually uh, 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 the among the purpose of the prophet is actually to improve uh, 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 akhlaq uh, uh, or behavior of of of, of mankind okay. so uh, these are the things we are we are muslim so we should be the pinnacle of pinnacle of akhlaq but sadly uh, as at least in malaysia muslim professionals muslim doctors they are not the pinnacle of akhlaq so this is something that i think we need to we need to improve and i think uae because these topics are taught at master level if you are doing masters this topic is a very important topic 
uh, if you if you go to study in other countries, in, in Western countries, for example, communication topics is very important because how they speak and everything, because I think, so uh, this is a very good uh, topic that we should cover. Uh, this is a very new topic as well, but I hope that you guys understand that uh, communication, good communication can solve so many things. Good communication can solve so many things. What I always tell students, eh, how you communicate things. Uh, one example, uh, when, you, when you are presenting cases, when you're presenting cases, you're presenting long case, when you're presenting anything, having a good communication skill will help as well. Uh, how you present things will actually help as well. I give you an example. This is, this is an example that you will always hear from me. Always, sampai you year five, the same example I'm gonna give to you. Okay, contoh, nasi lemak. Anyone here tak suka makan nasi lemak? Tak ada kan? All Malaysian, basically you like nasi lemak. All Malaysian, standard. Kalau tak suka nasi lemak, you better go out lah duduk kat Indonesia ke duduk kat mana negara lain kan? So Malaysian, we like nasi lemak. We love nasi lemak kan? Pergi kat UK pun cari nasi lemak kan? Walaupun nasi lemak tu harga 10 pound. Tak kira, nak juga nasi lemak kan? Sometimes, you you have this one uh, you have this one chef, a very good chef Tukang masak ni, very good. You tahu dah, dia kalau masak nasi lemak, nasi lemak dia memang sedap gila-gila. Proven, proven sedap dia. You pernah rasa memang you tahu, nasi lemak dia memang sedap. Proven by double blinded uh, uh, randomized control trial. Kan? Orang dah try-try semua random, memang tahu, memang sedap. It's proven, it's evidence based kesedapan nasi lemak dia. Tapi this chef ni, walaupun dia sedap, tapi presentation dia, dia ambil letak nak, nak dalam plastik buruk je, soal kabar, letak atas soal kabar, lepas tu campak nasi dia, campak sambal, campak dia punya telur dia, campak dia punya ikan bilis dia, lepas tu diikat macam tu je. Will you feel tempted untuk makan tak nasi lemak tu? Walaupun dia tahu evidence based, by evidence, the nasi lemak is tasteful, sedap, is by evidence. Tapi bila presentation dia macam tu, would you feel tempted untuk makan nasi lemak tu? No, isn't it? Bila presentation dia buruk, main campak gaul semua, nasi dengan sambal dia gaul macam tu kan? Rupa tak ada. So even though you know, factually it is tasty, tapi presentation dia buruk, you won't feel tempted to actually rasa benda tu. Walaupun you know by evidence it is tasty. Tapi you pernah makan nasi lemak dekat hotel tak? Some of us pernah makan nasi lemak dekat hotel. Is it tasty? It's very tak. rare. It's very rare to have nasi lemak dekat hotel yang tasty. Usually standard nasi lemak dekat hotel memang tak sedap. Kan? Kita tahu dah. It's by evidence base. It's by experience. Expert experience. It's even by our own personal experience. We know nasi lemak dekat hotel memang tak sedap. Tapi bila kita pergi hotel, kita rasa macam nak makan tak nasi lemak tu. Walaupun ada kedai mamak kat sebelah tu, kita tahu sedap dia. Kan? Kita rasa nak makan. Why? Sebab presentation dia menarik. Nasi dia nampak shiny. Ada steam dia keluar kat situ. Dia punya sambal nampak nice. The presentation is so nice. Telur dia pun nampak bentuk cantik je. Nampak telur pun rasa, ush, sure sedap kan. Tapi kita tahu dah tak sedap. Evidence base, kita tahu tak sedap. Tapi because of presentation is nice, we feel tempted to try. So it's the same with communication. It's the same with presentation. Your presentation may be excellent. Ada cukup ramuan-ramuan dia. All the rempah semua dah ada dalam tu. Everything complete. Tapi kalau you presented it buruk. Maknanya, kepala ke bawah, kaki ke atas, kat mana, kat mana. Very poor command of English. Kan? People won't be tempted. People won't, won't get interested in your presentation. Even small error, people will notice. Because presentation is bad. Walaupun cukup ramuan dia. Kan? Tapi, kalau your presentation is nice, very good command of English, good intonation, with very good uh, flow of thought, lepas tu, uh, apa nama, uh, dia punya uh, pace dia pun proper, very good command of English, you spoke with confidence, ada eye contact, kan? Bila you present it well, 
kan even sometimes major error pun people boleh miss this is human nature so sama so having a good communication skill i think it is very very important for you as a medical student and also for you as future doctors one more reason why this topic is important is because you guys we have started you guys with the new man or ski punya style exam kan previous block pun ada man or ski kan one of the man or ski ni ada communication punya part and so far our experience is your seniors your colleagues not your seniors your your colleagues perform very badly in communication punya station tak reti apa uh, probably because we haven't taught you properly jugaklah so it's not it's not actually your fault juga probably because we haven't taught you properly juga so we think that probably this session will help you at least to pass your exam okay clear ha huh. berapa minit dah ni <coughs> okay 15 minutes of just uh, talking nonsense <coughs> Okay, all right, let's go to our slides. So, the topic uh, this morning will be communication in pediatrics. The first thing, children are not small human. So, I can I ask you, you, can you, you just see one slide ke you nampak banyak slide? Only one slide. Satu je, Satu slide. Okay. One slide. Right. So, <laughs> the first thing is children are not small adults. Children, they are not a miniature homunculus. They are not a small version of an adult. They are actually children. They are different human being. How different? They are different according to their dev development stage. Then, different age, they are different. They differ in terms of their capability. They differ in terms of their potential. They differ in terms of their in terms of everything in terms of what they can do. They differ in terms of their physiology. They differ in terms of the bugs that can actually cause infection in them. So they differ everything. In neonatal phase, they are different. In infancy, they are different. In the toddler phase, they are different. In uh, school going age, they are different. In uh, in in uh, uh, teen. Teenagers, they are different. In twin, they are different. So they are all different. They are different in terms of physiology of them. They, are they have different pathophysiology at different stages. They have, they have even different bugs. Kuman pun, bacteria pun is differ according to their, their age. So children, you cannot treat them as a small miniature adult. They are not miniature adult. They are not miniature homunculus. They are themselves. They are themselves. You need to treat them as by their level and their requirement. So do not treat them similar. They have different sets of things. Everything is different with them. Okay. You can interrupt me eh? if, if you have anything that you don't agree or you want more clarification, you can interrupt me anytime. <coughs> so as I told you, they are not small humans. They are not small homunculus. They are not miniature human. They are not miniature adult, not miniature homunculus. They are different. They have different cognitive development. They have different motto and speech development. So how you speak to them will differ. Then, uh, in, in, a, in a smaller child and a bigger child, how you speak to them will differ. Then, uh, sometimes, for example, if you want to speak about... Uh, uh, if you want to speak about, let's say, uh, a child with uh, relapse leukemia, for example. Relapse leukemia problem ke tak problem? Relapse leukemia. Problem lah. Relapse leukemia, prognosis is poor. Very bad prognosis. So, sometimes when you, when you communicate with the child, do you need to actually tell the child? The other this 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 disease. No. Do you need to? Uh, no. No huh? need. No. No need. Aziz kata no need. Faizal kata no need. Siapa lagi? Siapa lagi yang ada ni? Tak nampak siapa yang lain. Siapa yang kata perlu? Are we obliged as 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 doctors? Boleh tak kita tak bagi tahu patient tu? Hmm. Boleh ke tak boleh? Ya, sepatutnya kena. 
Sepatutnya Sebab kena. the capability to comprehend Dia disease, dia tak faham lagi Mak dia dengan ayah dia Kita bagi tahu. Okay Lepas tu you nak buat prosedur, contohnya you nak buat uh, Bone marrow aspiration You nak buat lambat puncture Should you tell? Or should you just tell the parents? Kena tell the patient as well Siapa yang kata tell, kena tell the patient? Siapa tadi? Anissa. Anissa. Ah, Anissa. Okay, so kalau kalau parent cakap, ah, doktor, jangan beritahu anak saya nanti dia sedih. What would you say? Tetapi um, budak tu as a patient juga, di mana kita nak buat all the procedure dekat badan dia. So we need to macam at least respect kot. Macam minta, at least kita inform dia. Yes, I like this answer. So again, we treat the patient. We don't treat the parents, but the parents are important in terms of caring for the patient. The other issue involves, contohnya, issue legal, for example. In Malaysia, kalau you tengok in, in, in other countries, in UK, in Canada, dia ada satu kategori dia punya young adults. So young adults ni are children more than 15 years old. So diorang ni boleh bagi consent, boleh bagi macam-macam. In Malaysia, no. In Malaysia, consent age is more than 18. Less than 18, dia tak boleh bagi consent. Consent dia is by the punya guardian dia. Any parents or, atau any yang legally kita label as the guardian. So these are people yang ada power of consent. Budak tu tak ada power of consent. So kalau kita dapat kebenaran, kita dapat daripada father dia, daripada parents dia, legally we are, we can do anything yang consented by the by the parents. But as doctors, as doctors, we, kita ada kita punya, uh, ni kan, oath kita kan, Hippocratic oath tu. Siapa boleh remind me, remind us what are the Hippocratic Oath? Syarafina nampak sengih ni. Mesti biasa orang sengih-sengih ni dia ada, dia ada answer dia. Ada four principles kan? Kena, kena oh, ada no. ethics. Huh? Kena ada ethics. Yelah, etik sudah ada empat kan? Hippocratic oath tu. Apa Hippocratic oath tu? Budu, faham. Tak lagi tak kira lagi. Benevolence. Apa lagi? Do no harm. Do no harm. Kan? Lagi apa? Primum non nocia. Ah, sudah. Hmm. So, we have our ethics. So, we need to we need to care for the patient. So we do need to inform the patient. Cuma how do we inform them? It needs to depend on the level of level of uh, cognitive ability of the patient and cognitive understanding of the patient. For example, new needs, you nak buat you nak buat lambat puncture. Takkan you nak cerita pada baby tu. Baby won't understand, isn't it? Tapi in in bigger children, kalau patient tu contohnya dah more than 8 years old, for example. You need to tell them. So, uh, sebab itu Nabi pun ajar kita kan. Uh, khotibun nas ala qadri ukulihim. Speak to people based on their level of their understanding. Khotibun nas ala qadri ukulihim. Based on the level of their cognitive function. So, different stage. Contoh 8 years old, you may talk a bit like this. But you don't need to tell in detail. Kalau children yang more than 12 years old, if you want to talk, probably you can give more factual and things. So level tu kita kena, kita kena accommodate. Yes, legally, parents pun dah cukup. Tapi but for the patient, we do need to inform them as well. Apa-apa kita nak buat prosedur, <coughs> even small child, kita kena, kita kena bagi tahu. And we should not, we should not lie to them. Cakap nak pasang line, cakap pasang jarum kan, kata no, tak sakit, tak sakit, tak sakit. Kita tell them, it is it is painful but sikit je sakit dia. Kan, jangan tipu pada patient. Kan. Okay, and then you remember juga uh, the children, they will differ in terms of their upbringing as well. Kalau upbringing dia tak ada exposure to good communication, for example, the patient won't actually understand good communication, good interaction and things. Tapi kalau macam keluarga tu memang daripada awal, dia ajar benda-benda yang scientific, dia tengok benda-benda yang bagus 
ada banyak intellectual punya discussion dalam family dia parents dia dia daripada awal daripada kecil aja daripada budak kecil everything they discuss in family for example this patient is much easier for you to discuss with them kan tapi kalau patient yang memang family jenis macam paternis paternistic punya decision anak-anak have no decision in the family so sometimes that will be a bit more difficult so upbringing will actually affect how they how they can communicate with you as well and how you can communicate with them as well so understand their upbringing and understand parental expectation as well some parents they expect differently for their their child <coughs> okay next newborn are still to be communicated with so many doctors many students bila dia pergi pada newborns kan those less than 3 months old kan baby baby baru lahir how do we communicate with them some people sometimes kita just kita tak communicate with them pun bila kita nak pasang line dia kita tak acknowledge dia pun kita just hmm pop pegang tangan terus pop terus cucuk dia kan tak communicate with them kan newborns they are still to be communicated with kita still kena kecek dengan dia kita still kena bercakap-cakap dengan dia It's okay. Some some people kita tend untuk bila bila newborn ni kita tend untuk macam uh, apa uh, baby talk dengan dia kan. Ah ba 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 apa semua. Actually newborns you can speak with normal normal speech lah but you don't expect them to answer lah. Kan tiba-tiba kalau dia answer dengan proper you pun terkejut kan. So you should speak to them because newborns hearing is actually the first sense that actually develop in utero the first sense that actually uh, being developed in utero is actually your hearing if you if you look at the quran kan quran mention the senses that are developed in nasama wal basar kan sama is the first uh, 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 sense that actually being formed kan? and then your sight kan in nasama so your uh, your hearing is the first thing that lot of newborns even masa dalam perut even masa in utero they can actually appreciate sounds they can appreciate verbal cues so if parents actually used to talk to them sebab tu kalau you all nanti siapa-siapa yang ada anak ada baby masa baby dalam perut lagi kena ajar cakap dengan baby tu you read books to the baby even when the baby is inside mom's punya uterus kan duduk kat tepi baca buku sebab the baby can actually hear you and this will actually help it in future life Kan? And you know babies, they respond to social cues. They know smile, they understand smile and things. So you need to, uh, you need to show them social cues. They understand, and they understand partially. And you know, baby they sense parental voice that are exposed antenatally. So kalau parents selalu cakap dengan baby, when baby hears, when baby listens to their parents punya voice, they are more calm then. Then, then, then others. They can rasa tenang. They can. It will help them in terms of growth. Pun studies have shown, uh, babies yang parents just lalu dengan dia, touch dia, and everything, cakap dengan dia, they actually improve better in neonatal punya setting. So they they can sense parents punya voice. Kalau dia biasa parents lalu biasa baca Quran, for example, parents yang biasa dengarkan baby masa dalam perut with Quranic recitation. And baby itu akan jadi more calm apabila kita biasakan bacakan Quran dan sebagainya. And some studies have shown rhythmic sounds. Eh? Sometimes certain type of rhythm, certain type of songs akan buat children tu pun rasa calm and improve better in terms of their uh, EEG and things. And studies have shown eh, reading to them, reading to them. If you read books to babies, it uh, they have Uh, better, uh, they have faster uh, literacy. Babies that are being read, they have better literacy. Sebab tu one of the few of the intervention program dekat Afrika, they actually uh, hire volunteers to read books to to babies. Sebab when you read books to them, they have higher literacy later on in life. Dia cepat sikit baca buku. Kalau kita baca buku kat dia masa dia, baby. So babies walaupun dia newborn, walaupun dia tak pandai apa, tak pernah cakap apa, you should still communicate with them. And communicate properly. You don't need baby talks. Biar baby yang cakap baby talk. Adults we speak properly. Walaupun comel, biar baby tu yang comel. Orang tua tak payah berangan-angan comel. Biar baby tu yang comel. Kan? So we should read to them, we should speak to them with proper 
proper talk lah. <clears throat> okay, when you communicate with patient, so again you need to remember as pediatric as uh, as uh, we are pediatrician, we uh, kita bukan setakat cakap dengan patient, kita cakap dengan parents as well, cakap dengan family members as well. Sometimes the orang uh, uh, the person yang ada power dalam family tu not necessarily the parents. Sometimes the grandfather. So sometimes we do need to call in the grandfather as well. Siapa yang ada power, ada influence dalam family tu. So sometimes kita kena kita kena jumpa. Okay. First thing is you need to remember bila kita nak jumpa patient, kita kena plan the session. Kan dia tak dia ideally is not an ad hoc punya interview. It's not an ad hoc punya meeting. It should be a plan punya meeting session. So kita kena plan, kita kena rancang. Kan? So, bila kita plan, kita kena ada clear objectives. What are the things that we want to achieve by this meeting? Kita kena clear. Sebab kalau kita tak ada clear objective, kita pun tak tak boleh nak 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 nak, nak susun betul-betul lah. We won't uh, uh, we won't reach anything. So kita kena ada clear objective. And then appropriate personnel as well. Siapa yang nak kena ada? Kan? Is it okay contohnya kalau error, medication error? kan you dah terbagi ubat salah pada satu baby kan who who do you need to uh, go and meet the uh, parents is it okay to just send houseman or send medical student to go and meet the parent of course not probably you need someone more senior is mo enough sometimes you need to send a bit higher up sometimes you need to send your specialist consultant to come into the meeting sometimes you need your legal advisor to come and join you Most of the time, you need another uh, a staff nurse to come and accompany as well. Sometimes you need, uh, sometimes, uh, contohnya you nak plan patient yang nak discharge, complicated patient, uh, Down syndrome with uh, laryngomalacia. Ni ni, this happened quite recently. We have a patient with Down uh, with Edward syndrome, with laryngomalacia, on rice tube feeding, uh, uh, and satu tu on oxygen lagi. So it's a complicated discharge. So bila nak discharge kita nak jumpa, nak plan dengan parents, apa nak buat dan sebagainya, siapa yang kita nak bawa. Sometimes kita kena bawa occupational therapist untuk join sekali. Untuk ajar parents macam mana nak buat terapi. Sometimes kita kena panggil community nurses untuk join our meeting. Untuk plan discharge dia macam mana. Sometimes kita kena panggil dietitian sama. Kalau patient on multiple benda untuk nurse. Siapa yang kita nak panggil sama. So we need to have the, we need to plan the appropriate personnel for that session. Adakah okey kita seorang atau kita kena panggil orang lain. And then schedule time. Sebab kita kena dalam keadaan yang tenang, parent pun kena dalam keadaan yang tenang. It should be a schedule time. When it is scheduled, you are more prepared. Sometimes kita rushing. Bila kita rushing, bila kita explain, kita very difficult to reach to objective. Kan? Kita pun sometimes senang jadi emotionally affected kalau kita rushing. Parents pun kalau dia tengah rushing, kan? Dia nak pergi toilet contohnya kan. Jadi kita cebut nak cerita panjang lebar kat dia. Dia stres tak? Mesti dia stres kan. Kita pun sama. Kan? Kalau kita tengah rush something, kita tak boleh nak reach kita punya objektif. So kita kena plan. It should be a scheduled time. And then, <coughs> uh, lagi, start, bukan setakat scheduled time, it must have a preparation. Kita kena prepare for the session. Kena ada good information. So kita kena dapat background information lah. Parents dia kerja apa, apa background dia, apa background orang yang join dalam meeting kita ni, siapa yang akan join, apa information yang kita nak bagi. Sometimes contohnya kita nak even simple benda, kita nak counsel uh, mother baby yang ada G6PD deficient. Kita nak kena counsel. So kita kena prepare lah information dia. Ada leaflet dia yang kita nak kena bagi kan. Uh, tu siapa personal yang join Sometimes kita boleh offer Kita boleh estimate apa questions yang parent biasa tanya FAQs Kita boleh prepare Kan kita boleh juga offer Okay mother Kita nak jumpa pada hari ni pukul ni Kalau ada sebarang soalan Mak boleh plan tulis dulu soalan awal Sama ada bagi pada kita awal Ataupun tulis bagi masa Masa meeting tu Kita cuba discuss Kita cuba settle apa Questions yang mak ada And apa concerns parents sebelum discharge for example So concerns tu semua kita kena settle So plan, kena ada clear objective Appropriate personnel, it must be a scheduled time And it must be have preparation, good information Information on both side And the personnel, appropriate personnel Prepare the questions and 
concerns of the of the parents. Okay, settings. Macam mana setting kita nak prepare meeting tu? <coughs> First, it should be it should have a privacy. Kita tak boleh jumpa satu parent nak discuss satu isu, parents lain boleh dengar dan tengok. Kan? It's not appropriate as well. It should have a privacy. The more uh, the more problematic, the more complicated the case, the more privacy it needs. For example, kalau kita nak cerita contohnya baby yang dying, baby yang dah brain dead for example. Baby yang ada HIE stage 4 yang kita nak extubate, kita nak withdrawal of care. Baby yang palliative care ataupun mana-mana children yang memang dah end of life punya care. Kita nak bagi tahu pada parents yang your children, your anak ni will die. Kita nak extubate and most likely bila kita extubate, anak ni akan mati. Kan? Do you think it's appropriate for us to do in an open area? Kan? No. It needs to have a proper privacy. Proper privacy maknanya kalau parents nak menangis, dia boleh menangis tanpa malu pada orang lain. Dia ada area yang dia boleh, uh, dia ada privacy dia. Ataupun sometimes ada isu yang kita nak discuss yang mungkin boleh menyebabkan malu pada pada parent. Contohnya kita nak bagi tahu HIV positive for example. Kan? Atau HSV, benda-benda yang ada uh, kemaluan lah. Kan? So sometimes kita kena ada area privacy supaya uh, parents boleh, uh, kita kena jaga dignity of the patient and also dignity of the of the parents. Even benda sampai, even benda simple macam COVID-19. If you want to inform a patient, you are COVID-19 positive. Boleh tak kita buat dalam open, public? Semua orang tahu. What's going to happen kalau semua orang tahu? Huh? What's going to happen? Kat Malaysia ni what's going to happen? Dia rendah. Viral. Viral. Tentera bawang Malaysia. Tentera bawang Malaysia ni is known all over the world. Tentera bawang Malaysia ni is among the strongest worldwide. Kan? It's among the most notorious. Benda simple pun jadi complicated sebab tentera bawang Malaysia ni. Kan? Baru-baru uh, uh, ni, our hospital ada outbreak. Itu pun our neighbours, me, kita semua ni yang frontliners apa semua ni kan. Neighbours pun jadi macam stigmatised. So, it's very frustrating. Kan? We have one, not we lah, uh, in the hospital we have one death. Uh, COVID-19 positive. Uh, among the question yang family tanya pada doktor tu was uh, doktor, apa yang nanti jiran-jiran akan cakap ya? Eh? Sebab in Malaysia, if you have something like this, you will be stigmatized. Orang semua akan pulau, takut tengok ini family ni COVID-19. Kan semua orang ni mau tak 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 dekat, tak nak communicate. Telefon pun tak nak sebab dia takut kena COVID through telefon. Kan? So uh, stigmatize. So sometimes kita kena jaga privacy patient tu. Ha? Kita kena uh, setting tu mesti setting yang allow for privacy. Ha? So sebab inilah tentera-tentera bawang ni. Ha? Lepas tu uh, kita make sure apa yang kita cerita it stays in the room. Kita pula jangan lepas kita bincang ni kita pergi share dekat group whatsapp hospital. Satu hospital tahu penyakit orang ni. It's not appropriate as well. It should have a privacy. They should have a privacy. Kita kena jaga privacy. Kadang-kadang kita tengok kat Facebook kan. Ada je orang share oh, hari ni on call hospital ada patient ni datang dengan ni 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 ni. Masalahnya adalah sometimes it's traceable. We should never share something yang traceable. Yang orang boleh tahu. Oh patient ni orang ni orang, orang ni. Tak boleh. We should not share something yang traceable. Benda semua boleh kena saman. So kita kena jaga privacy and kena jaga anonymity of our patient. Orang luar tak boleh tahu. Even orang selain daripada parents dia tak boleh tahu apa problem dengan anak dia. Kalau kita cakap dengan patient adult for example, selain daripada or dia selain yang dia dia bagi tahu, dia allow kita untuk bagi tahu, orang lain tak boleh tahu sebab kita kena jaga dia punya privacy and anonymity of the of the patient. And it should be comfortable. It should the, the when we when we plan the setting it should be comfortable you nak cakap contohnya anak dia is dying kan you kena bagi mak dia duduk sebab you tahu santai bila dengar berita yang shocking kan kadang-kadang mak pengsan atau macam mana so kita kena bagi mak tempat dia boleh duduk kan 
kita kena bagi situation tu must be comfortable ada tempat duduk janganlah explain dalam keadaan berdiri dan sebagainya kalau berdiri pun ada tempat dia boleh duduk dan sebagainya so it should be a comfortable area it should be a comfortable area tidak terlalu panas tidak terlalu sejuk dan sebagainya so it should be comfortable and then it should have the setting should have appropriate personnel i've told you before kena ada orang nak hantar siapa nak hantar specialist nak hantar consultant nak hantar director hospital sometimes you need direct hospital director untuk join sometimes you need siapa untuk join kalau patient tu tengah saman kita for example kita need appropriate personnel tak boleh hantar siapa-siapa je so kena hantar orang yang appropriate for for the purpose siapa yang attend it should suit the purpose as well sometimes kalau tempat yang kalau kita nak discuss benda yang heavy benda yang sedih tempat tu kena suit the purpose kalau kita nak discuss benda yang simple kita nak discuss benda berkaitan dengan for example kita nak explain pasal management current management current situation of the patient sometimes it's better to do at the bedside tepi katil sebab kita tunjuk ah patient ni on ventilator macam ni macam macam ni ini SPO2 ini apa ni apa sebenarnya kita boleh tunjuk walaupun ada patient lain kat sebelah so it should suit the purpose. Kita nak buatkan mana? Buat dalam bilik ke? Buat dekat bedside ke? Atau buat dekat mana? Ataupun buat kat tempat yang kita boleh draw for example. So, mana tempat nak buat? So, itu pun depend kepada situation. Sometimes kita nak jumpa patient, nak counsel. Sometimes, <coughs> I've done several, kita buat dekat rumah patient tu. So, kita datang rumah dia. So, the venue of the event, of the session must suit the purpose, the objective of the of the of the session. It should be appropriate room, appropriate equipment, apa yang kita nak tunjuk kalau kita nak ajar parent pasal CPR, kita kena ada lah benda-benda untuk buat CPR. Kena ada patung takkan kita buat CPR dekat anak dia. Kan? Contohnya patient yang kita discharge dengan oksigen dengan apa kita nak ajar mak CPR. Kan? So kita kena ajar ada lah dummy ada anak patung untuk kita ajar CPR tu dan sebagainya. So should have appropriate equipment. Sometimes kalau patient yang ada uh, congenital heart disease kita nak kena ada lah pen and paper untuk kita draw uh, right ventricle dia macam mana, left ventricle dia macam mana, mana dia punya shun dia, mana dia punya heart disease dia, what's going to happen, kita boleh draw. So you should have appropriate room with appropriate equipment available and there should be no disturbance. Phone kita kena silent lah. Tak boleh lah ada macam-macam tengah cakap sikit orang telefon, cakap sikit orang telefon, cakap sikit orang telefon, cakap sikit ada orang ketuk pintu dan sebagainya. So it should be you should ideally have no disturbance tapi kecuali lah sometimes kalau you are on call for example itu lain cerita tapi ideally you should not be disturbed the session should not have any disturbance okay any question so far <coughs> so next is introduction <coughs> so bila kita start the session uh, you should first is introduce yourself and all the attendees so <coughs> Ni sama eh, kalau you dapat man or ski kan, sama you should start with introduction. Introduction you explain lah, saya, siapa, 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 saya, doktor, siapa, siapa, and this is whom, this is whom, this is whom. Sama bila you buat, you buat, you buat short case, bila you examine the patient. When you examine the patient, you should always introduce yourself. Who I am and who are all the other attendees. You can explain. Kena beritahu ni siapa, ni siapa, ni siapa, and you also tell the role of everyone. Orang ni kenapa dia dalam meeting ni? Kenapa? Apa? What is the role? What is the role of everyone in the meeting and in the management of the patient? Uh, kena explain the role. Kena tell the role. And also don't forget consent as well. So, bila kita nak start kita punya kita punya session, interview session, kita nak start kita punya discussion, kita kena have consent. Maknanya, mak okay ke kalau kita buat, kita discuss pasal benda ni, 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 ini objektif dia boleh ke kita discuss kan so we always start our discussion with consent introduction and consent so introduce ourselves siapa and what is our role for this meeting and also for the management of sometimes ada orang yang kita panggil untuk dia catat kita kena bagi tahu lah orang ni doktor ni kerja dia mencatat for example kan so dan kita dapat consent. It's verbal consent pun okay. Boleh tak kita mula? Boleh tak kita discuss benda ni? Okay ke? So we should have consent from them. So contohnya kalau kalau contohnya your man or ski nanti, you dapat situation, ada patient diabetes, 
you nak kena explain about diabetes. So samalah you introduce yourself, you introduce everyone in the room and you get consent. Boleh tak? Hari ni kita discuss pasal diabetes. So you get consent from the from the uh, parents or the patient. <clears throat> and then a certain objective, you need to make everyone understand the purpose of the session. Semua yang datang tu, kena clear what is the objective. Objective tu kena clear. Tak boleh lah you nak target benda lain, orang lain nak target benda lain. Semua orang kena in the same mind. Semua orang kena same target. What is the purpose of the of the session. So dan tu clear daripada awal. Okay Mark, daripada this session, kita nak achieve this. Yang ni kita nak dapat. At least macam tu. So parents kena tahu, kita among kita ni team pun semua kena kena tahu. Sometimes among our team ni kita kena bagi tahu awal. Sebelum kita jumpa parents, kita kena sama-sama dalam team kita, kita bagi tahu. Okay, session kali ni kita nak achieve ni, 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 ni. ni. Sometimes tak semua benda kita boleh achieve dalam dalam satu session. Kita kena buat multiple session for example. Okay, and then you need to know background lah. Know the background. Know background of all the attendees. Semua yang datang ni siapa? Kan? Orang oh, yang datang ni uh, uh, physiotherapist ni, physiotherapist yang handle pediatrik ke tak? Dia biasa handle this case ke tak? Apa dia punya ni? Kalau kita punya community punya team, kita tahu tak background dia macam mana? Dia biasa handle tak? Dia pernah handle ke tak macam mana? Kalau kita panggil parents, parents ni macam mana? Apa education background dia? Dia boleh cakap bahasa apa? Language dia apa? Can they understand Malay? Ataupun dia prefer in English. Kadang-kadang kita ni, kita biasa kita mix. <coughs> kita cakap Manglish kan? Between Malay and also English. Macam sekarang ni. Campur. Malay, English. Campur Arabic sikit. Kali lain jedan. Kan? So, parents boleh faham tak kalau kita ada mix in English a bit? Kan? So, uh, ataupun kalau parents cakap Hokkien, for example. So, do we need a translator that can speak Hokkien? Kan? Ataupun parents cakap Tamil, for example. So, do we need uh, a translator that can speak Tamil? kan uh, so language siapa yang <coughs> parents cakap level of education because different level of education different concern so sometimes kalau parents yang educated you can easily cakap even medical terms dia boleh faham dia boleh understand about how virus work they can understand about vaccinology they can understand about so many things but if the parents contoh tak habis sekolah sekolah rendah pun tak habis sometimes you need to uh, Tailor down. So, khotibun nas ala qadri ukulihim. Based on the level of uh, education yang uh, parents tu ada. Apa pekerjaan dia? Kalau parents tu doktor, for example. Obviously, how you speak to them will be different. Kan? Kalau parents tu cikgu. Oh, cikgu lagi biasa susah lah sikit. Complicated biasa cikgu. Kan cikgu akan tanya banyak soalan. So, you kena prepare lah. Kalau parents tu lawyer, for example. Ha. Oh, so, different way of speaking bukan difference sebab kita dif, kita bias to people but level of approach tu must be differ must must differ and you need to know how deep you going to tell kan boleh settle banyak benda dalam satu masa ke tak kan so and then for example kalau you nak cakap pasal therapy for example kalau parent tu sendiri kerja physiotherapist you expect parents to know more about physiotherapy sebab dia memang physiotherapist kan so certain benda you boleh tailor down dia punya apa benda yang you nak cakap kan so apa pekerjaan parents and then level of prior understanding you need to ask as well you kena tahu berapa session dah sebelum ni yang dah dah discuss dengan parents tu berapa session dah sebelum ni apa yang pernah di discuss sebelum ni and you kena tanya juga okay kita baru nak sebelum kita start boleh saya tahu tak apa yang pernah doktor lain sebut sebelum ni ataupun kalau the previous session tu is with us We need to ask the parents. So Mak, Ayah, sebelum ni kita pernah jumpa, kita pernah discuss pasal benda ni, benda, benda ni. Hari ni kita nak discuss benda lain. Tapi boleh saya tanya, apa yang Mak faham pada discussion kita sebelum ni? Faham? Sebab sebelum kita explain benda sekarang kita nak achieve, kita nak make sure dia faham apa yang sebelum ni. For example, patient datang dengan meningitis. Kan, kita nak kita nak explain yang anak ni ada meningitis, kena buat lambat puncture. Sebelum kita explain dia buat meningitis dalam lambat pangcer, kita kena tanya parents dulu. Sebelum ni, sebelum jumpa saya, ada dua tiga doktor dah jumpa dengan mak. Apa yang diberitahu? Ha, so mak, mak cerita lah apa doktor cakap mungkin meningitis. Ada tak keluarga pernah cakap pasal, ada tak doktor sebut pasal lambat pangcer for example. Apa yang mak tahu pasal lambat pangcer. So we need to assess the level of prior understanding. Because 
sometimes dia ada confusion, dia ada misunderstanding. So kita kena settle that things first. Kan? Sometimes kalau dia dah faham benda tu, bila kita explain sekali lagi, dia akan jadi irritable. Kan? Kalau kita dah tahu benda tu, tiga empat kali setiap kali jumpa doktor, doktor akan explain benda yang sama. Sakit hati tak? Kan? Kita pun sakit hati. Daripada dia nak dan nak bagi consent, dia jadi ah geram. Ah, terus tak bagi consent for example. So Waktu kita kena tahu what is the level of prior understanding What has been informed to the parents before Waktu apa expectation Kita tanya, okay mak Session ni, ini saya harapan kita Objektif saya macam ni Ada apa-apa yang mak harap dari presesi kali ni Sometimes dia ada Ada expectation dia sendiri, ada benda yang dia sendiri nak The objective dia, apa expectation dia So kita kena settle that As well Remind me to give you these slides eh? <coughs> And then you assess understanding, I mentioned before, ask level of comprehension, whether they understand or not. And this level of comprehension ni, kena tanya, sebelum kita start, tengah-tengah start tu, tengah-tengah kita sembang dan pada penghujung, kita kena tanya dia, faham tak setakat ni? Okay tak? Clear tak? Ada tak apa-apa yang tak faham? Kan? In between kita cerita tu, kita kena stop, ask level of comprehension first. So sometimes, kita shock sendiri. Macam sekarang ni, shock sendiri aku, 50 minutes dah Cerita macam-macam, tak korang faham ke tak, tak tidur ke tak, menguap ke duit Korang nampak menguap kan, tak faham ke tak kan So we need to ask level of comprehension at every stage of the session At every stage of the discussion Between points, kita tanya, faham ke tak faham, clear tak, ada apa-apa soalan uh, Ni sebab tak nampak muka semua orang kan, nampak empat je dalam satu masa ni So, susah sikit nak tanya, let's go kita membesarkan Okay, fine. And then use language accordingly as well. Use language accordingly maknanya uh, sometimes kalau macam contoh eh, kita uh, kita uh, parents yang cakap kalau siapa kerja dekat hospital Temeluh for example, Hoshas Temeluh. Uh, uh, ramai parents yang boleh cakap Chinese saja, Hokkien uh, atau Cantonese. Dia tak faham cakap Melayu, tak faham cakap English. So sometimes you need to use language line. So language line, line ni sama ada by phone ataupun kita panggil translator untuk datang. Kan? Ataupun kita kena panggil appropriate personnel lah. Kena panggil uh, staff yang yang boleh cakap bahasa tu dan sebagainya untuk kita counsel. So counseling, you need to have, you need to know the appropriate language. Kan? Contohnya kalau parents tu Contohnya kita ada, kita ada lecturer yang 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 Arab for example dia punya command of Malay tak berapa bagus. So bila you nak counsel patient you tak boleh nak cakap English tapi parent parents tu tak faham. Kan? Kena cakap bahasa yang dia faham lah. So kalau dia tak faham you sama ada guna language line maknanya you telefon satu dia line language line dia yang ada translator dia ataupun you need to call appropriate personnel yang boleh cakap that language. And then avoid jargon where appropriate. Sometimes kita guna term yang terlalu medical punya term kan? Bila kita guna term yang terlalu medical Passion pun tak faham kan? Kan? So kita guna, kita ideally kita avoid guna jargon Kita guna bahasa yang faham pada level tu Tapi kalau parents tu adalah doctors for example Parents dia adalah healthcare personnel Kalau you semua guna bahasa orang kampung Dia pun jadi stress kan? So sometimes you need to use jargon when appropriate Eh? So, macam tu Use jargon when, when appropriate Bila macam doktor, bila apa semua Kita boleh guna bahasa-bahasa yang tertentu Okay, clear so far Ada soalan? Baru separuh daripada slide ni Satu jam dah, sudah And then cover the concerns Cover the concerns tu maknanya Kita kena, bila kita panggil patient Kita panggil parents untuk discuss about Something about the patient Parents tu dia ada concern dia, dia ada benda-benda yang dia risau, ada benda-benda yang bagi dia is a problem yang dia nak kena settle. So kita kena ask, kena ascertain what are the concerns, kita kena assess and kita kena cover. Kita kena go through all the concerns, make sure kita settlekan semua concern-concern tu. Faham? So sometimes kita ada objektif yang kita nak capai, tapi parents pun ada concern-concern dia, ada problem-problem dia yang dia nak minta kita settlekan. So kita kena go through all the concern kan? The diabetes on insulin for example Kita nak cerita macam mana nak cover insulin ni Tapi mungkin mak, saya pernah ada satu patient 
kita nak cerita macam nak kontrol diabetes. Mak punya concern adalah anak dia kalau pergi sekolah macam mana nak cucuk. Anak dia nanti bila tua akan ada problem tak? Anak dia nanti boleh kahwin tak? Boleh ada anak tak nanti? Kan? Anak dia dia boleh dapat cucu tak? So kadang pe- uh, patient tu concern dia different daripada kita. Kita tak fikir lagi sampai hujung anak ni boleh 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 dapat boleh mengandung boleh ada ni apa semua tak. Kita tak fikir sampai situ. Tapi patient ni dia fikir sampai macam tu. So sometimes kita kena cover the concern. Kita kena assess the concern, kita kena Settle the concerns of the patient and parents. So sometimes parents ada certain concern dia, patient pun ada certain certain concern dia. And then reassess understanding. I've said before, kita kena always reassess comprehension. It is very important at every stage, at every point, kita assess what is the level of comprehension. Faham ke tak faham? And then at the end of the session, kita kena formulate the conclusion. Habis session tu okey, kita dah nak ujung dah ni. Mungkin saya summarize sikit eh. Okey, summary kita. Point dia ni 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 ni. This are the summary. Kena always ada conclusion. Kena always ada summary dia. Ha, ataupun kita boleh cakap, okey, cuba mak simpulkan apa yang kita dah discuss hari ni. Kita boleh tengok dia faham ke tak faham apa yang kita cerita punya lebar kat dia. So, formulate conclusion, reassess comprehension dan conclusion eh. Okey. Alright. Next, other important points. First, empathy. So, empathy is very important. Empathy is not sympathy. So, empathy, kita sometimes we may be emotional. Okay. Ada orang kata, as doctors, we should not involve emotionally with our our patient. Okay, involve emotionally is something else. Tapi, kita can be emotional with our patient. Saya sendiri pun few times saya pernah menangis bersama-sama dengan parents. I've, I remember before, I think kalau my patient lah yang betul-betul yang I properly cry masa tu, I have one baby uh, masa I was in USM, baby tu ada infantile leukemia. So infantile leukemia ni, I think we, I started to look after that baby masa di umur 3 bulan. Daripada di umur 3 bulan, Oh, I think two months, less than two months kita dah look after that baby. Kita dah diagnose dia ada infantile leukemia, kita start chemotherapy. So that baby stayed with us. Dia masuk so, so, dua, satu dua bulan, dia balik beberapa minggu, dia masuk balik ward macam tu. And then I think uh, dia dah achieve goals into remission and then relapse balik. And I think she died at around 14 months old. Uh, dia punya first few step eh, budak baby tu, first few step dia dekat hospital. Very cute baby ni. Anak orang susah dekat gomusang. Cute sangat baby ni. Cabi, comel. Kan? Uh, dia punya first few step pun de- dekat hospital with us. Dia ada dia punya walker dia dekat hospital tu. Sekarang kita kita round, dia akan ikut sekali round budak tu. Kan? Tapi baby ni dapat dapat relapse and she was in a very bad condition. Kita tahu dah the baby is dying dan kita allow dia Balik to die at home. Masa hari dia nak balik tu memang semua menangis. Sebab kita tahu dah baby ni dia, memang dia mati on the way pun. Tak sampai rumah pun dia meninggal. Tapi dia meninggal dalam perlukan mak dia dan dekat kawasan rumah family lain ada lah sekali. At least. Tapi hari dia nak balik tu dengan still ada bleeding daripada mana-mana. Kita nampak breath, dia punya penapasan dia, breathing dia pun tak berapa bagus. kan? Tapi dia dah palliative care, kita allow dia balik. And I was the one that discharge the patient masa tu. And it was very, very emotional. Very, very, I nak cakap pun susah. Kan? Uh, sometimes we can be emotional with our patient. I remember satu kali, satu another incident. Eh? I have a patient, 13 years old boy with acute myeloid leukemia. Kita tahu acute myeloid leukemia, pro, uh, dia, punya, dia punya prognosis is not that good. Kan? Uh, lepas tu, uh, dia da, da, pergi remission, lepas tu dia relapse balik. Dia relapse ML. Relapse ML is very poor prognosis. Uh, acute myeloid leukemia, very poor prognosis in children. So, satu hari tu, when I was doing round, budak ni umur 13 tahun, yang memang masa tu, I think was his last few weeks of life. Dia dah nak mati dah time tu. Tapi dia still breathing, still okay lah. Cuma dia nampak very lethargic, nampak letih apa semua kan. I, I was doing round, budak ni baca satu buku. Tahu apa buku dia baca? Buku dia baca is bagaimana menghadapi kematian. Budak kecil umur 13 tahun, 
at the end of his life was baca, baca satu buku bagaimana menghadapi kematian. Ah, can you imagine? So kita orang nak pergi round, tengok budak tu tengah baca buku tu. And patient tu died I think two weeks plus after that. After that session tu, they died two weeks plus after that. So we can be emotional with them. I did remember, dia cakap, patient ni 13 tahun eh, dia cakap pada mak dia, dia dah lama tak tengok laut. So apa yang dia nak adalah, dia nak tengok laut sekali. So kita arrange ambulance, bawa dia pergi pantai. Masa tu dia dah tak, tak larat nak bangun pun tak boleh dah. So mak dia, dokong dia, letak dia dekat atas pasir tu. Can you imagine? And I think he died two to three days after that. And then, then dia kata, dia, terima kasih sangat sebab kita bantu dia uruskan supaya dia boleh tengok laut buat masa kali terakhir hidup dia. Kan? Is it, isn't it emotional? So we can be emotional with them. But we are not supposed to involve emotionally with them. We can be emotional with them but we are not supposed to involve emotionally with them. Jangan sampai kita punya emotion affects our judgement. Jangan sampai our emotion affects our judgement. Okay, but we need to always show appropriate emotion. I've seen doctors before, dia nak counsel yang patient tu is dying. Tapi emotion muka dia senyum. Kan? Muka senyum. Ah, Assalamualaikum mak, saya nak explain ni. Anak puan ni dah mati dah ni. Ha, muka senyum. Boleh tak? Tak boleh. Kita kena show appropriate emotion. Bila emotion sedih, kita tunjuk muka sedih. Bila berita baik, oh Alhamdulillah. Uh, anak dah achieve remission. Kita kena tunjukkan uh, appropriate emotion lah. Gembira lah. Kan? Janganlah kita nak explain pasal anak dah achieve remission, anak dah perform baik dengan treatment. Kita buat muka sedih. Oh, Assalamualaikum mak. Saya minta maaf lah. Uh, tapi itulah uh, keja- uh, rawatan kita berjaya mak. Tapi kita buat muka sedih. Tak ada lah. So kita kena show appropriate emotion. Kalau gembira, gembira lah. Kalau sedih, sedih lah. Problem dia adalah sometimes doctors I've seen several times. Kan? Bila appropriate emotion should be of sadness, of empathy, dia tak tunjuk appropriate emotion tu. Sama ada dia tunjuk muka still gembira ataupun tunjuk muka empathetic, muka yang tak ada perasaan. Tak boleh lah. You need to show that you share the emotion of the parents, of the patient. So kita kena show appropriate emotion at that particular time. We need to understand their feelings. Kan, manusia ni ada perasaan. So, kita kena share dia feeling. Kita kena try to understand dia feeling. Kita tak boleh kata, Mak, saya tahu Mak rasa macam mana. No, we will never, we will never fully comprehend what the mother is feeling. Tapi, we can share dia feeling. We can share dia feeling. Okay. And then how to question. So it should be open-ended question. So open-ended versus close-ended. Kita kena guna appropriately. Ideally kita guna open-ended question. But sometimes kita kena ada close, directed or targeted question kalau kalau needed. Macam mana perasaan? Apa faham tak macam mana? So kita most uh, ideally kita guna sebanyak mungkin is open-ended question. Mana question yang kita allow parents itu untuk explain. Rather than yes, no. Faham tak? Uh, better kita tanya uh, apa apa yang mak faham daripada kita discuss hari ni. Rather than kita tanya, faham ke tak faham? Kan, jawapan yang yes, no, sometimes it's problematic. Tapi sometimes kita kena, kita kena guna. And then the other thing is, do not fit words into the mouth of the parent. Jangan kita yang bagi word. Mak, uh, apa yang mak faham? Tapi sebelum kita sebelum tu kita kita yang fit word tu mak faham uh, ni kita yang bagi word pada dia. So do not fit words into their mouth tapi kita yang guide dan kita kena inform kita kena so do not fit words into the mouth. Okay. The other important thing is be a good listener. Many doctors kita suka berceramah, berceramah aja goreng aja. Kan? But a good doctor should be a good listener. Sebab itu sometimes kan kita ingat kita pun sama kan. Uh, sakit, demam apa semua. Jumpa doktor je, oh, hilang terus demam. Biasa macam tu kan. But sometimes a good doctor is a good listener as well. Only a good listener may be a good speaker. To tell things properly, you should be a good listener first. Kan. The, 
you can only tell things properly kalau you can listen properly first. So, kita kena dengar apa yang mak punya concern. Kita kena dengar apa yang parents punya cakap. So, sebelum kita berceramah pada orang, kita kena dengar dulu apa yang orang tu nak nak cakap. Okay. And then, non-verbal. Non-verbal. Non-verbal things are very important as well. Apa yang saya masukkan dengan uh, non-verbal ni? First is intonation. Tonasi kita, kan? Uh, in, kalau kita cakap benda sedih, somber punya ni. So, the intonation should be a somber punya tone. Slow, dia punya amplitude dia slow. Cakap pun perlahan-lahan, saya minta maaf. Tapi saya rasa anak puan ni sudah pergi. Anak puan dah tak ada dah sekarang ni. Ha, tadi kita dah cuba dia datang telah keadaan yang sangat teruk kan tak boleh lah puan saya nak cakap ni anak puan tadi mati dah ha so ton tonasi kita kena betul kan ton dia kena betul kalau ton yang kalau berita yang sedih intonasi dia kena ton yang somber lah kena slow kena ton dia kena ton yang betul facial expression pun sama kalau berita sedih facial expression kita kena yang betul lah kalau berita yang gembira kena intona, kena facial expression yang sebab actually most of our uh, communication is by body language is non verbal non verbal is very very important non verbal may show our honesty it may it may uh, provide trust and everything so non verbal is very important facial expression intonation facial expression body language macam mana cara kita punya tangan kan sometimes kalau tangan macam ni dia menunjukkan mungkin uh, factual uh, intelligence wisdom tangan macam ni kan kalau tangan macam ni kalau parents tangan macam ni kita tahu it is defensive punya contoh ni kalau kita nak cakap dengan parent kita nak cakap yang contohnya anak dia dalam keadaan yang teruk for example kita jangan uh, anak dia dah meninggal lepas kita jangan assume uh, defensive punya stance defensive ni tangan macam ni this is defensive kan kita kadang kena open. Open sama ada tangan kat depan, kat tepi. Tak boleh nak tunjuk lah online ni. Kalau proper dalam teaching, I can show you. So, the body language actually shows the stance that the patient have. So, having appropriate body language is important. Mana letak tangan? For example, you nak counsel benda benda important, benda sedih. Tangan jangan letak dalam pocket. Kalau letak tangan dalam pocket, lepas tu you explain. Explain, explain it doesn't show uh, kejujuran. It doesn't show that. Kan? So you need to have a appropriate and proper body language. Faham? Kan? Tangan, kalau tangan kat belakang, uh, maknanya dia open tapi dia ready. Kalau tangan kat depan macam mana? So every where you put your hands, where how your body position actually will show so many things. Kan? Uh, and then position as well. How you position yourself. Sama ada you berdepan-depan macam tu ke? Sometimes bila berdepan ni, sometimes dia ada element of uh, confrontation. Sometimes it's better kalau kita duduk belah tepi. Contohnya dia berdiri, uh, contohnya uh, kita berdiri macam ni. Kita berdiri sebelah dia for example. Bila kita berdiri sebelah dia, it shows that we are with them. Rather than we are opposing them for example. Sebab itu kalau banyak banyak situation kan. Bila kita nak counsel, benda sedih semua. Ideally kita in 90 degree daripada orang tu. Sebab bila kita 90 degree kan, it shows that we are with them. Sometimes kalau benda yang lagi sedih, kita duduk sebelah dia. Bersebelahan. Kan? Kita nak cerita benda sedih, kita duduk sebelah dia. Sebab kita boleh cakap sebelah-sebelah macam ni. So, the position that we are in actually will help in terms of the communication. Sebab kalau kita berdepan-depan, dia ada some element of confrontation. We are at opposite sides. Especially kalau benda yang besar, ada error dan sebagainya. Bila kita depan tu, It shows that we are at opposite side. Tu yang senang jadi kena saman dan sebagainya. So, where we position ourselves is actually important. Uh, so, positioning tu betul. It's difficult for me to actually show you the position doing online macam ni. Dia sepatutnya in the proper group lepas kita buat dalam classroom setting. So, it's easier. So, but my, my point is how we position ourselves is important. Kalau kita depan-depan, sometimes dia ada element of opposition. Kita confronting each other. Nah, tapi kalau kita duduk sebelah, 90 degree, sometimes dia nampak kita boleh senang nak approach dia. Kalau benda sedih, kita duduk sebelah-sebelah sebab kita bersama dengan dia. Bila kita bersama sebelah-sebelah, it's easier for us to feel them and it's easier for them to feel us as well. Faham? And then 
ambience. So ambience ni macam mana? Contohnya uh, kalau benda sedih kan si ambience dalam bilik pun kena uh, kena ada elemen sedih lah. For example kita nak bagi tahu anak dia dah meninggal. So ambience dalam bilik tu tak boleh lah. Ceria, ada belon-belon, ada apa benda kan. So dia kena ada ambience yang sesuai. Suasana dia, bi'ah dia kena sesuai dengan objektif yang kita nak bawa. And then touching, sentuhan. Sentuhan is important as well. Janganlah pergi sentuh belakang semua. Tapi sentuhan is important. Kan? Bila kita counsel benda sedih, kena ada orang yang 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 tepuk bahu parents tu, pegang, gosok belakang, for example. Kan? Sometimes kita nak convince kan people pun kita touch. Sebelah kanan, sebelah kiri dia ada cara touch dia. Tapi I cannot show here lah. Kalau ada session proper nanti kita boleh buat. Kan? How you touch people, kan? Kena salam dia, for example. Covid-19 ni musim ni tak boleh salam-salam kan? Tapi macam mana? So, touching is actually very important untuk touch people punya Contohnya bila you cakap satu point, satu point yang penting You touch dia sekali Untuk you tau cap kan? So, you, you reinforce the knowledge So, subconscious, bila you explain You cakap satu benda, you sentuh bahu dia Dia masukkan, subconsciously, dia masuk dalam dia punya subconscious mind Dia memperkuatkan, reinforce the The, the the in whatever information that you trying to say so touching is actually very very important okay mirroring mirroring satu lagi skill eh mirroring ni maknanya contohnya you mirror the tone and body language for example kalau you nak counsel satu satu patient kan you kena mirror dia punya tone kalau dia cakap dengan you cakap dengan orang arab for example orang arab kan dia punya tone dia tinggi kan dia cakap you dengar macam dia marah sebenarnya itu biasa je bagi dia kan So, sometimes bila you nak counsel dia, you punya tone pun kena tinggi sikit. So, kalau dia tone tinggi, you tone rendah, bila tak matching, tak ada mirroring, dia tak akan masuk. So, you, sometimes you kena matchingkan tone dia. Kalau tone dia dalam keadaan tone yang rendah, dia tengah sedih, for example. Lepas tu, you pergi cakap dengan tone yang tinggi. Dia tak akan masuk juga. So, dia kena ada mirroring. So, you mirror your tone. Kalau tone dia tinggi, you tinggikan. Bila tone dia rendah, you rendahkan. Body language pun, mirroring body language. Kalau dia duduk, you duduk. Kalau dia letak tangan atas meja, you pun letak tangan atas meja. So benda-benda ni akan subconsciously akan affect dia punya understanding dan sebagainya. Spikes. Ini satu lagi benda kalau you tengok, kalau interview, counselling dan sebagainya, ada satu elemen dipanggil spikes. Spikes ni apa? Spikes ni adalah First S is setting up the interview. Kita kena set the interview. So setting up the interview kena ada mentally rehearse. You kena prepare dalam your mind. Rehearse mentally apa nak cakap dan sebagainya. Arrange privacy, sit down, use open body language. Body language tu kena open. Maknanya tangan tak ada macam ni. Tangan tak ada dalam pocket. Tangan kena open. Lepas tu P for perception. So elicit the patient. Ni benda yang kita dah discuss sebelum ni lah. So elicit patient's perspective. Apa perspective dia? Apa pandangan dia? What's the belief? And apa perasaan-perasaan dia? Apa dia punya feels? You assess vocabs and comprehension. Assess apa level vocabulary yang you nak guna dan level kefahaman dia. This is perception. Perception of the the orang yang kita jumpa dan our perception as well. And perception of all the attendees. And then invitation. So in I for invitation maknanya you ask the patient what they want to know. So bukan setakat invite to, to that meeting but invite to actually ask. Invite to share knowledge. Ha, kita share, kita invite dia. Boleh tak cuba explain apa yang dia faham? Apa yang dia tahu? Sometimes parents kan, dia tahu benda lebih pada ni. Apa yang mak rasa setakat ni, mak pun datang tolong bagi bagi feeding pada anak. Apa yang mak perasan? Ha, bukan kita nak test dia tapi sometimes dia tahu sebab kadang dok, kita doktors, kita tak ada dengan patient 24 jam. Nurses yang ada dengan patient 24 jam. Tapi parents pun setiap kali datang dia bersama dengan dengan patient. So sometimes dia pun tahu some, some, something. So we invite them to uh, share their knowledge. And kita kena invite dia. And then K is knowledge. Provide info in small packages. And use simple language. Uh, jangan banyak sangat information bagi. Semua benda you nak bagi dalam satu session, tak boleh. You kena bagi knowledge in small packages, bagi in small pieces, plan awal-awal. E for emotion. Explore the emotion involved and explicitly recognize and give empathy. You need to empathize with the 
passion. So emotion is important. Human ni kita banyak affected by emotion. Fact tu satu tapi emotion kita uh, banyak affected lah. And then next is strategize and summarize. So kita kena set out the medical plan of action, kita arrange follow up semua, kita strategize the plan, strategize the meeting, strategize the further plan and give summary. Ask patient to provide summary. Kita bagi summary dia berapa yang kita dah discuss dan sebagainya. Okay, that is spikes. Next, call for help. Call for help ni maksudnya apa? Call for help maknanya kita kena offer to discuss with seniors. Kan, sometimes ada benda yang kita tak tahu. Contohnya, bila benda tu jadi complicated, kita nampak parents macam concern tu lebih, kita boleh offer. Mak, mak nak, nak tak saya arrange session jumpa dengan doktor pakar yang ni, yang ni, yang ni, yang ni. Nak tak kita buat arrange jumpa, mak nak jumpa dengan pengarah hospital. Boleh tak kita boleh arrange untuk jumpa dengan pengarah hospital for example. So offer to discuss with more senior. Sama kalau you dapat you dapat man of ski, you di you disuruh kena counsel parent untuk something. One of the things you need to offer is offer to discuss with more senior people. Nak tak jumpa dengan doktor pakar yang ni? Mungkin ada benda yang dia boleh explain lebih baik for example. So also offer to refer. Nak tak saya rujuk pada psychiatrist for example untuk dapat support. Nak tak saya rujuk kepada community. Nak tak saya rujuk kepada dietitian. Siapa lagi yang kita boleh refer? Mak nak tak kita refer pada siapa-siapa siapa siapa dan sebagainya. So we offer to be referred and offer for follow up. Okay, kita dah buat session ni. Okay tak kalau kita buat satu lagi sesi selepas ni? We offer for another follow up for the patient management and offer for follow up of discussion. Kan discussion ni sometimes mak perlu ada benda dia nak clarify balik. So kita offer. Offer mother to call other people as well. Contohnya ketua kampung dia for example. Kita nak discuss pasal LP tapi yang decide boleh buat LP ke tak ni sebenarnya ketua kampung dia for example. Kita panggil, kita offer. Nak tak panggil orang tu kita discuss sama dengan dia. Siapa yang ada authority. Siapa yang ada power, ada influence dalam family tu. So kita offer untuk panggil. Hmm. And other aids. Other aids ni apa? Other aids ni for example visual aids. Perlu tak gambar, lukis gambar jantung uh, kalau ada congenital heart disease. Ada chart tak? Kalau patient contohnya you nak explain yang prematurity ni ada risk dia untuk neurological deficit kan? You tahu? Pre, uh, extreme premature baby 30% uh, have severe neurological sequelae. Another 30% have mild to moderate neurological sequelae. Uh, Uh, 30% die, mortality rate dia 30% uh, for example. So sometimes you need to have visual aids to show parents apa benda yang you nak you nak, you nak cerita. Uh, you need to ada charts, drawings dan dan sebagainya. Okay, that's it. So prepare. So plan, empathy, comprehension, uh, Involve proper non-verbal, ni semua-semua elemen yang penting untuk communication. Okay, clear. Any questions? Ah, Doktor ada soalan. Hmm. Bila kita nak tahu macam mana apa uh, background background orang tu, bila kita nak tahu background dia? Time, dia kena tanya sebelum tu ke? Okay, Sa okay satu ni kita tahu daripada apa kita punya apa kita punya apa information yang dah sedia ada lah so, bila kita plan kalau patient kita dalam admission note dia patut dah ada parents dia kerja apa for example kan ataupun orang yang dah pernah counsel patient ataupun nurses nurses ni selalu dia kuat sembang dengan 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 patient-patient nanti you kena tanya nurses ah tahu tak mak dia kerja apa tahu tak ayah dia kerja apa you be surprised information yang dia orang tahu sebab nurses ni dia duduk sama dengan lama dengan parents tu semua sometimes dia tahu benda-benda yang kita pun tak tahu macam mana dia boleh dapat that information kan so sometimes kita tanya lah, kita dapat those information tu satu, yang kedua ni adalah kita tanya juga mak ayah boleh saya tahu background tak? kerja apa? Ha, dulu belajar kat mana for example kan? Ha, so kita boleh tanya, so kita tanya kita dapat information daripada medical records ha, daripada records yang ada kita tanya daripada our colleagues, eh? our colleagues maknanya doktor yang lain yang jaga dia, our junior doctors, nurses, but nurses, nurses they spend time with the patient and the parents. Doktor dia round 
Nurses tengah jam, one hour, tempat prosedur pun dia settle. Tapi nurses all the time dengan patient. So dia tahu more. So kita dapat information daripada dia orang. And kita kena tanya direct pada uh, tanya pada attendees tu lah. Tanya. Uh, uh, kerja apa kan? Eh? Cik kerja apa? Sometimes walaupun kita tahu dah dia kerja apa tapi kita tahu kadang-kadang medical record ni lama punya record for example. So kita tanya lah. Kerja apa? Kerja kat mana? Kerja kat sini. Tata jiran kita ke apa ke. So sometimes those things selain daripada kita dapat information untuk kita punya communication dia juga is a good item for Uh, breaking the ice, kan? Uh, saya senang kita nak start the discussion, right? nak break the ice is important as well. Okay, okay. anything else? Anything else? Clear? Boleh buat? Kalau dapat senario untuk communication boleh buat properly, boleh introduce yourself properly, uh, boleh boleh uh, introduce all the attendees, boleh explain the role of all the attendees, boleh uh, dapat consent, boleh assess comprehension, assess understanding at every level, boleh buat summary, huh? boleh buat conclusion, boleh? Acik, offer for follow up, offer for referral, offer to speak to seniors, semua tu boleh buat? Clear? Clear? Okay. Last. Any question? Any question? Again, as I said, communication is among the main reason untuk medical legal. Uh, the main reason, major bulk of uh, medical legal adalah poor communication. My time pun dah start macam-macam. During your time nanti, bila three or five years later, bila you all semua jadi doktor, Masa tu lagi lah orang saman kiri kanan depan belakang. Uh, so masa tu more important for you to actually have proper communication skill. Okay. Faham? Clear? Yeah. Okay. Uh, doktor. Ha. Apa tanya ni? Baik lah. Ha. Yes. Ha. Doktor nak tanya. Uh, macam mention ke dia minta untuk doktor rahsiakan dia punya macam keadaan lah daripada ibu bapa ke atau ibu bapa minta rahsiakan daripada patient boleh ke macam tu? So Malaysia ni kita ada problem sikit sebab kita punya act kita tak recognize uh, kita tak recognize young adults so orang yang boleh bagi consent orang yang boleh bagi decision adalah those yang more than 18 years old less than 18 years old dia tak boleh, dia tak ada legal punya uh, Dia tak ada local standi So dia tak ada, dia tak ada, dia tak ada power Faham tak? So contohnya kalau macam you ada patient ada relapse leukemia Umur 14 tahun Lepas tu cakap doktor boleh tak tolong jangan bagi tahu parents dia Tak boleh Kan? Uh, you, need, you, need, you, you need to you need to test sebab parents dia adalah yang ada power untuk buat anything uh, Sama juga bila kalau you explain dengan parents dulu Waktu parents kata, don't tell their children. You tak boleh pergi belakang parents dia pergi bagi tahu. Tak boleh sebab legally, legally parents dia ada ada power. But as a doctor, because you are treating, you are not treating the parents, you are treating the child. So you need to tell the child as well. So, but you are legally, you cannot you cannot go behind parents too. Sebab parents ada legal power. So, what can you do? discuss properly lah dengan 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 parents dia. Cakap hmm. ya betul mak ayah memang ada legal power tapi saya rasa kita perlu bagi tahu dia sebab rawatan dan sebagainya akan involve sakit ni. So dia kena tahu. Cuma cara kita nak bagi tahu tu macam mana. Dan budak-budak ni you you'll be surprised walaupun kita tak bagi tahu they know actually. Kan? They know. Ah they are not kita jangan anggap budak-budak ni macam tak ada akal lah. Dia orang hanya you will be surprised. Even small children, they understand so many things. So we need to counsel them. Ada satu situation je. Yang mana kalau patient kata jangan bagi tahu orang lain tapi kita boleh. Kita, we are uh, obliged legally to actually bagi tahu. For example eh, HIV positive. So kalau satu couple ni, seorang hmm. tu ada HIV positive. 
Dia kata jangan bagi tahu pada dia punya suami atau isteri. Boleh tak kita tak bagi tahu? Sebab dia patient, kita tak boleh cerita penyakit seseorang pada orang yang lain tanpa ada consent. Kan? Uh, untuk penyakit lain kita tak boleh bagi tahu. Tapi untuk HIV ada dalam legal. So kita boleh cakap mak, ya kita cakap J uh, uh, ke siapa ke? HIV positif memang kita tak bagi tahu pada orang lain. Tetapi sebab HIV positif ni ada pasangan, kita sebagai doktor kita dikendaki oleh undang-undang untuk bagi tahu pada pasangan. Uh, so saya saja tapi kita still bagi peluang lah dia untuk dia yang cerita sendiri. Uh, tapi kalau tak, kalau tak bagi tahu juga kita bagi time, kita terpaksa atas undang-undang untuk beritahu. Uh, macam tu. Clear. Tapi untuk penyakit-penyakit lain ni uh, tak ada lah. Hmm. But it's not easy lah. Contohnya kalau 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 budak tu, contohnya kita dapat patient kanak-kanak yang dapat HIV positif kan. Ha, kita kena kita kena kita kena inform, kita kena inform pada patient, kita kena inform pada both parents kena tahu. Tak boleh mak saja, tak boleh ayah saja, kan? Ha, so banyak benda isu dari segi legal dan sebagainya lah. Hmm. Okay. Okay, okay. Right. Tapi di antara benda yang penting ya, saya nak saya nak pesan kan. Introduction tu penting. Lepas tu uh, uh, introduce yourself and all the attendees, uh, explain the role, uh, explain the uh, get consent, explain the objectives, assess understanding, assess comprehension, good appropriate good use appropriate body language and non-verbal communication, use appropriate language, uh, apa nama use uh, use appropriate language. Lepas tu assess understanding at every level, make conclusion and offer for referral. Nah, ini semua benda-benda yang yang important lah. Nah, okay, clear, okay, boleh buat. Okay, I think uh, it's already one hour, one and a half hours. Um, okay, let's uh, end this session with Umu Kitab Al-Fatihah. You wait lah. Eh?